Good morning. Welcome to North Madison Congregational Church. It is Pride. Well, it's ONA Sunday here at the UCC, and we are celebrating at NMCC as a proudly open and affirming congregation. And uh, we're glad to have you here with us today. Today's also the last Sunday that our choir is singing. Sort of. We are going to sing one more time in July, but, um, but we're glad to have you with us. And here we go. the mighty this morning uh, in this weather so thank you for being here in the chilly moist humidity whatever we got going on as you can see we decided to move indoors today instead of worshiping outside on the grassy knoll for obvious but sad reasons yes so um, yeah so uh, welcome welcome I'm Heather Arkovich. For those who don't know me I'm pastor in these here parts where we say that all of our members are ministers and uh, we believe that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we hope you feel that way. Today is uh, Open and Affirming Sunday. So you see we've got some uh, rainbow flags, the progress flag, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that. But as an Open and Affirming Congregation of the United Church of Christ, we celebrate um, Open and Affirming Sunday today. Today is also, well, it was going to be the last day that our choir was going to sing on Mass, but in fact, uh, we're also going to sing together the second Sunday in July. So yay, bonus. Um, but so that is today also. So uh, I worship leading today with Linda, who's up there on the keyboard, Tom, who was trying to make our tech go, but once again, YouTube's thing. So we're live on Facebook. Hello, Facebook. Um, we have our lovely Deacon Laura here behind us, who will also be our soloist this morning, and um, all of you. I see our poet has arrived. Uh, one of our speakers is on her way. She had some printer problems. So, you know, we're rolling with it today. However it rolls, we're going to roll too. So, welcome to worship, and here is uh, Laura with our Deacon's greeting. Good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to be here with you this beautiful ONA Sabbath morning, the last Sunday of our choir season. I am Laura Prohaska. My pronouns are she and her. Your presence enriches our time together. <clears throat> I hope our worship will be meaningful and inspiring to you and that you leave here transformed and more deeply connected to your own heart, one another, and to our Creator. And before we move on with the service, I think we have a little surprise in store. We do. But Lynn isn't here yet, is she? Oh, well, we're going to do this anyway. So she's, coming. she's coming. So Gail and Barb and Peter Meyer, would you mind coming up here? And if Lynn arrives, Lynn is arrived. Look at Peter. He's like, what's happening? Come on up. And uh, Gail, I think you have a couple of words. And Barb has a couple of things. Well, today, um, <clears throat> we want to honor Peter Meyer, no. who doesn't, doesn't, take, doesn't take to these things too well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a bunch of us started working on open and affirming a long time ago. Um, Peter started before some of you were born, so uh, it's, uh, it's, um, and uh, he has just kept a firm hand 
on an unruly group of daisy pickers, and he keeps calling meetings and putting together a reasonable and intelligent agenda, and kindly pushes us forward, and I think he's been working on it, honestly, for 20 years. Well, a lot of ministers have come and gone. <laughs> <laughs> and some were more enthusiastic than others. And Peter just kept going. So if um, you want to mess with him, you know you've got a long journey. You know? <laughs> so Peter, we're here to thank you. He is now retiring. <laughs> But there you are, there you are, he's, he's, you know, there you are. So Peter, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for oh. bringing us to this place that we can proudly say we are an ONA church. And we did our covenant, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you. No. <laughs> that through the applause. Um, Peter is stepping down as longtime leader of our ONA activities and uh, Lynn and Barb have stepped in to co-chair so they're beginning their co-chairing journey and Lynn will be speaking today in worship so it's very exciting. Um, so that's what's up with that. And now uh, Peter's dear daughter Laura, we keep it in the family around here, will lead us in our open and affirming covenant. On February 5th, 2017, NMCC voted to become a part of the Open and Affirming Coalition of the United Church of Christ and adopted the following ONA covenant. On this ONA Sunday, across the denomination, ONA churches remind and recommit ourselves to our covenant promises and bear witness before God. Will you join me? North Madison Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, Commit ourselves publicly to be an open and affirming community. Grateful to God for creating us in our rich variety, we gather to worship, serve, and model justice in an unjust world. As followers of Jesus, we promise our love and support to all persons, embracing differences of age, race, ethnicity, mental and physical capability, marital choice, sexual orientation, gender identity, faith background, and socioeconomic status. Upheld by the Spirit, we welcome the authenticity of each other and affirm the dignity and worth of every person. Together, we create a safe, inclusive community where we are called to witness God's love for the world. Amen. Please be seated. And let's continue in our gathering litany. You're the all. <laughs> Each of us is created with worth, imbued with dignity. We are the representation of God's love in the world. We are diverse in our experiences, vast in our manifestation of how love looks. Our families are all different, but each represents and honors the many ways that God's people live and love. Our lives are enriched when LGBTQIA plus people are welcomed and affirmed in our churches and communities. Our lives are enriched when our black, Latinx, and indigenous neighbors are affirmed. We all suffer when any LGBT when justice is denied to any of us, justice is denied to all of us. Until we are all free, none of us are free. May we work 
to build a world where all people are affirmed with love. Amen. This is the time in our worship service where we settle in, where we remember that this is Sabbath time. The rabbis tell us that six days of the week we work in the world, but on the seventh day, the seventh day we let the Spirit work in us. So I invite you to close your eyes if you feel comfortable or soften your gaze and settle in to the sanctuary that is you this body that God has given you, the place where your spirit rests. Feel the weight of your body, and whatever is supporting it. Feel your feet on the ground. Feel the power of the earth connecting and grounding you. Begin to feel your oneness with all that is. And slowly, as you're ready, I invite you to breathe in God's light. Hold that light within you, and then imagine you are a prism. And as you exhale, you radiate the rainbow. Breathe in God's pure, bright, life-giving white light. Hold it within you, and exhale all the colors of your life. Continue to breathe at your own pace, slowly and thoughtfully, breathing in that white light and exhaling like you were a prison, all the color of life. Holy One, we know that in the beginning, our creation stories tell us that you breathed your breath into earth and moisture, mud, to make humanity. Help us truly to feel deep in our earthen bones the presence of your sacred spirit within us with each breath. Help us to feel the illuminating presence of your light within us with each thought with each awareness, with each feeling. Help us, O oh God, to know that just like all the colors of the rainbow come from that one white light, all of us in all our beautiful, amazing diversity truly are just simply one in you. And be with us now as we worship. Amen. So, as I mentioned, we have a poet in our midst, and as we celebrate today, we have two parents as well who will be reflecting for us. So I'd like to invite Kate Summerlin to come and share her poetry with us, 
and then Lynn Bowling will share her reflections. Thank you, Heather, for such a beautiful reflection, that idea of white light fracturing into the rainbow is a, a nice image to, to um, take with me. Can you hear me? Um, as the parent of a transgender child, you go on a journey you never thought that you would take. And with their changes, you have changes. There's changes in their clothes, there's changes in their looks, sometimes there's changes in their name. But there's one change that's, that's kind of tricky, and that's language. Your language changes when you have a transgender child. And um, that's been a, sort of a tough one for me. And as I've walked this journey with Eliza, I've been able to process it a little bit through writing about it and through poems. And I want to share with you a poem today that I wrote. It's called Vocabulary. Daughter no longer, son neither. You birthed yourself somewhere in between, invented a new vocabulary, invested in a new dialogue. Your body gave you permission to speak. We are learning the language now, not without hesitation, but infused with love. We stumble past what was familiar, changing tenses, understanding how the plural can satisfy the singular, educating ourselves as we become aware of our linguistic limitations, our binary ways of speaking the truth, our license to exclude and shame, no more. Your liberation is contagious. It infects our outlook with all the possibilities of being human, heralding a brave new world when called by any other name is recognized simply without translation family. printer didn't work today, so I'm <laughs> loud, yeah. Um, so I'm reading from my phone. <laughs> um, so hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lynn Bowling. A lot of you know me. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. And I'm pleased to be speaking with you today on this beautiful Pride Sunday. I'd like to open with a really touching quote that I found recently. Uh, I don't know who wrote it, but it goes like this. Motherhood is about raising and celebrating the child you have, not the child you thought you would have. It's about understanding that your child is exactly the person they are supposed to be. And that, if you are lucky, you might, they might just be the teacher who turns you into the person you are supposed to be. It's hard to say that without crying. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> um, as many of you know, I'm the mom of a trans masculine child uh, named Parker. Parker's 25, believe it or not, now. Um, <laughs> when Parker was a child, he liked to dress what could be traditionally seen as um, in boys' clothes and play with the typical boys' toys. And uh, we didn't think much about it. You know, I just thought he was a tomboy. No big deal. Little did we know that Parker had had strong feelings about gender for a long time. He said that this, from the second he knew the difference between male and female, he wanted to be a boy. He thought that this was normal <laughs> and that he would outgrow this. But the feelings didn't go away, however. He just suppressed them 
when he found out that this wasn't normal. As Parker grew, it seemed that everything was going along fine until junior high school. It was then that he started to feel depressed and angry. Uh, he, but he didn't know why, and we didn't know why. Um, it turns out that this is, a tip, this is very typical of many trans um, people and trans kids uh, with, their, with their experiences with puberty. Um, as they're going through puberty, they, they see that their bodies are developing in a gender that doesn't represent their identity. Um, this is called gender dysphoria. And the Mayo Clinic defines it as the feeling of discomfort or distress that might occur in people whose gender identity differs from the sex assigned at birth or sex-related physical characteristics. And this can be devastating. I, um, I brought some books today that if you get a chance, you can look through. Parker's uh, drawing is in here as well. Tony's put these together, drawings of how um, transgender youth can feel with gender dysphoria. Um, okay. So, I'm sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, well, I can't find the paragraph, but I'll just say it. So, uh, Let's see. So Parker started to go to um, therapy and also attend um, gender and, a gender and uh, sexuality group at the high school. Um, then at, at 16, and, uh, we also went to therapy. Um, at 16, he was absolutely sure he was a boy um, and came out as transgender. Uh, I didn't know what to think. I had never even met one transgender person, and I was scared, and to be honest, totally floored. Um, what was my child's life going to be like? Would he be safe in this world? What would he look like as a boy? He was, he was a beautiful child. Would his personality change? I was afraid our relationship would change. We always, we always had a close, close relationship. Why would he want to change so drastically? But little by little, things started to get better. He started transitioning to um, a masculine identity. Um, and he seemed much happier and, and more at peace with himself. And that was what really mattered. And. I feel like this is what all of us want for our kids. Eventually, he started taking testosterone shots. And with each shot, I saw the light in his eyes come back that I hadn't, we hadn't seen in a while. Um, sorry, <laughs> I might need tissue still. <laughs> um, Some people think that children should not have any kind of gender affirming care, um, especially hormones. But hormones are essential to a huge percentage of transgender children. And to say children, this is adolescents, you know, basically, not young children. Um, without the right kind of gender affirming care, Trans kids can suffer anxiety, depression, self-harm, and sadly, even suicide. Um, 
pregnancy. The discomfort can be extreme. They need support and people to believe in them, preferably their parents. Um, there's a um, statistic, I should have gotten the source, but having just one accepting adult in an LGBTQ person's young life reduces their suicide risk by 40%. In addition, there's a belief by some people in our country that young children have surgeries. This is absolutely not true. Also, the only hormones that a child nearing puberty would go on would be hormone, homer, hmm, excuse me. Hormone blockers to prevent them from going through puberty for a while. This puts a pause on puberty and gives a child a chance to think about whether to uh, transition or not. This is absolutely reversible and does no harm to the child. It's also a huge advantage to, so the child doesn't have to go through puberty twice because they go through it again when they start replacement therapy. Um, so, yeah, and then also um, replacement therapy is uh, testosterone and estrogen, and that is administered late, later in the uh, child's adolescence. Another intervention is also surgery. Children don't have surgery, and it's extremely difficult for an older adolescent to get surgery. It's a very long process of doctor's appointments, endocrinologists, psychiatrist appointments, multiple calls to the insurance company, et cetera. And it's certainly not done on a whim. Back to Parker's story. <clears throat> he, now he was feeling, um, at that time when he first came out and started taking this hormones, he was feeling uh, much more secure. and. Um, I also found support myself. I found a wonderful support group that, um, founded by Tony Ferriola that's come here and, and spoken. Um, he's a trans activist and he's fantastic. I also discovered that an old friend of mine, Jill, um, had a trans son. I ran into her at one of the support groups and that was a God moment, I think. I really do think. Um, we reconnected, we reconnected, and we've been supporting each other ever since. Um, now, I, after that, I found that most of the things I was worried about for Parker as he was going through the transition did not happen. He looks great, although I'm a little prejudiced, being a mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's still the same person he always was, just a truer, more authentic version of himself. Okay. Um, these days, a few years later, um, he identifies as uh, non-binary and, and uh, transmasculine, and uses the pronouns he and also they. Um, as uh, non-binary can be difficult to understand. In fact, I don't think any of us being cisgender, which is, uh, you, cisgender means, most of us here are just cisgender, but some of us are not. Um, it's you identify with the gender you were assigned at birth. Um, so, you know, we, you may not understand that, but that's okay. You don't have to understand. You just have to love and accept. And many of you, most of you here have, and I am so grateful. <sighs> okay, so presently, unfortunately, Parker is not as happy and content as he, as he used to be, and he's suffering depression and anxiety again, as many trans 
many trans individuals are in this country. It seems that some people in power are using LGBTQ plus communities for political leverage. There are almost 500 bills that have been proposed in the state legislature, legislature um, presently um, that threaten best basic, in the basic freedoms for individuals. Um, these, these bills can uh, threaten life-saving health care, um, the bathroom that someone chooses to use. They can cause, uh, they can cause discrimination and harassment, and the list goes on. And they don't have to be turned into laws to cause harm. They, they just don't. Um, also, Connecticut has, has, has had five bills proposed this year, believe it or not. Um, so, so these bills say to say to our um, our trans um, community that you're not okay and that you should change and you shouldn't be who you are. Um, it's heartbreaking, yeah. And it seems that some politicians want to erase transgender people. Um, that's the phrase, I didn't use that phrase. Parker used that phrase, has used that phrase. Especially youth that they are tar targeting without any understanding of the science behind it. Um, gender affirming care is, is, has a very clear and is supported by many health organizations, including the American Medical Association. Regardless, there are far too many Americans who follow the ideas that this is not something real and shouldn't exist. Um, I believe that a lot of it is uh, lack of understanding and education. So what can we do to help our transgender um, people? folks. Um, first, normalize using pronouns, first and foremost, and asking pronouns. And some people think that's silly, like why should I, you know, I look like a woman, why should I have to say that? Well, it, it says to your audience who, uh, there may be transgender people in or may love a transgender person, it says that this is a safe place and it's inclusive. And that's extremely important. Um, okay, also call out transphobia if you hear it. Um, third, reject the idea that transitioning looks like one thing. It, it, can, it can be many things to many di different people. That's okay. Um, Another thing, this is a little awkward, but it's been asked of me, and I uh, don't ask about genitalia or body parts. Uh, you wouldn't ask another parent, oh, what is your, you know, what does your child have? I mean, that's just not something you should be asking. Um, let's see. And also, we can use our privilege to support them. Um, there's different ways to support them, but um, you can support some ju social justice organizations. Um, ACLU is a good one. Um, human rights, um, human rights campaign, <laughs> um, and so forth. Um, and you can also call your um, Congress. Congress people. Um, so to end, um, hopefully things will get better, but you know, it starts with each and every person being understanding, loving, and supporting.
well, understanding, I mean, you don't understand the issue, but to be understanding of um, their feelings and being compassionate. Um, I didn't put an ending on here, but uh, anyway, I hope this, this helps. And um, happy Pride Sunday. I just want to say, Lynn has been the most amazing parent and a terrific role model for me. And there are not many of those around, so I really applaud you. Thank you, Lynn. I think we all could feel. Now can we hear? Hello. All right, easy other one. Um, I think we could all feel the heart in what you said, and certainly also in your poetry, Kate. This is heart stuff. Not hard, it is hard, but it's also heart stuff, and it's vulnerable, so thank you for having the courage, really, to share with us. Um, in that vein, I thought it was sort of interesting. You know, I like to follow the lectionary, uh, and that's our calendar, three years, and then allegedly we'll get most of the important stories of the scripture. And today's lectionary passage speaks to this idea of brave parenting. You might not see it at first, but listen to this. Genesis chapter 21. The child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Now you remember, Isaac is the son of Hagar, right? The servant. But now, Abraham has another son by his wife, Sarah. So here we go. So Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, playing with her son, Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman. Cast her out with her son. For the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, don't be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it's through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also. Because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child. And he sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under some bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him, a good way off, about the distance of a bow shoot, for she said, do not let me look on the death of my child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid. For God, God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come. Lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. 
May the church hear what the Spirit is saying to us. I don't know if you've noticed this morning in these stories, but we seem to have a problem in our community, this nation of ours, and in our church, in the tradition in which we stand, about recognizing who the children of God are. We get so caught up in who the children of Abraham are, hmm? that we overlook who the children of God are. This is an interesting story because we have two sons birthed from the same human father, two different human mothers, and the human father and the mothers were willing to see these children as somehow less than being born of God. They seemed to think that they were born of them and then somehow had different value, right? Well, the son of Hagar will let go. The son of Sarah will protect. But God, God heard the voice of the boy who was rejected. That's why our congregation, that's why the covenant that we have made to be open and affirming is so important because as you've heard this morning, we have families who are told by the community around us and the ways we ourselves have been raised that it's okay to reject our children or that it's scary when our children are different than what community says they should be. Because then we become afraid for their safety. We become afraid we're ready to parent them. We become afraid of what it's gonna look like for them to fully come into who they are in the world. But that fear doesn't come from God. That fear comes from us from traditions that allow us to throw our children away, that go back as far as humanity can remember. That's why we have these stories. Because from the very beginning of God's people, there's been this question, are my children pure enough? <laughs> are my children coming from a good enough lineage? What if they look different than they're supposed to? And time after time after time, in this story and other stories, we find God. <laughs> over and over, collecting the one who's caught in this kind of enmeshment, collecting the one who's tossed out, and saying, you, you are my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. We have some big flags up here on the wall today. And I don't know if you know the story of these flags. The flag on your left is the progress flag because originally the gay pride flag was just a rainbow. Why? Because even in the gay community, we overlook the fact that there's a whole lot of racism and homophobia within the gay community and some of our own homophobia comes out in transphobia. So we realized we needed to add some more stripes if we were really gonna be welcoming of all. So we put in stripes for people of different color ethnicities and the trans community as the rainbow flag. And this flag changes all the time. Now there's new iterations of the flag that add more and more and more identities. And some people say, why do you need to do that name? All the different things. Just like some people said, do you remember when this church became open and affirming, there were people within our congregation and without who said, oh, I mean, we're going to be welcoming, but do we need to put a flag outside? That's not unique to our congregation, by the way. That happens in every congregation that becomes open and affirming anywhere. How visible do we need to make this? Can't we just be welcoming and just not really say anything about it? Just slip the boy a little skin of water in the desert and he'll be okay. But do we need to lift up and name the fountain for him? <laughs> this other flag says remembering Stonewall and it has a fist on it. And a lot of times people don't like it when there's a fist, right? That's sort of a... Uh, uh, protest thing, not a celebration thing, and that can make some of us uncomfortable. But it seemed important to flag this, to hang this flag today because Stonewall, we have celebrated more than 50 an years of an its anniversary, right? It was in June of 1969, and what happened? Well, a bunch of mm, transgender folks and drag queens were in a bar, gay bar, a lot of gay folks, and the police did what the police did at the time and still do sometimes, they raided the bar and harassed the people. And the people that were inside that particular bar, that particular day, not unlike Rosa Parks on the bus that particular day, it wasn't the first time that they had reacted badly to police harassment. But for whatever reason, it was the catalyst time. 
And so the police came in that day and started dragging everybody out of the bar. And by the way, you know what would happen. You'd lose your job, you'd lose your family. You were publicly humiliated. Your mugshot would go out. Everybody knew you were outed. So if you were trying to live your life in some private way, that was over for you and for your family, whose son or daughter or transgender child was suddenly now not good enough. So that day, the raid happened. They were pulling people out, and one of the drag queens yelled, are you gonna let this happen? And the rest of the queer community that was there that day said, no, we're not settling for a skin of water in the desert anymore. We are stopping this now. And a year later, a parade was held. And a year after that, more. And now here we are 50 years later, where even our little town, our little sleepy Mayberry Madison has a pride parade. Well, we don't have a parade, but we have a pride day. Guilford had a parade, we might get a parade, we'll see. <laughs> oh. And it's important because if it's not your child or your child, it's gonna be somebody's child. If it's not being gay or bisexual or transgender, it's being black. Ooh, it's being black or an immigrant or left-handed. One of the first times we had a transgender person come and speak to our seminary, the person was the son of a Baptist preacher and herself had been a Baptist preacher as a man. <laughs> Because as a Baptist, you saw what just happened in the Southern Baptist Convention, she wasn't allowed to be a preacher as a woman. So she came and spoke to our seminary and she started the story by talking about when she was a child and being in school and how she was just harassed by all the other kids and the harassment was led by the teachers because she just didn't fit in and we were all there like, oh God, that's awful. And she said, yeah, and you know why? Because I was left-handed. We as human beings find anything we can to try and figure out, am I good enough? Are you good enough? Am I safe? Am I in? If I can make you the one who's weirder, that makes me feel a little safer. Whether you're left-handed, whether you're gay, whether you're black, whether you're a vegetarian, whether you're a Republican, whatever, we're gonna find something and say, you are less than me. Your kids are less than my kids. That's what we do, and we build churches with steeples that point to these things. But that's not what God does. God was there with these children when their parents separated them out. God said, I'm gonna build a great nation out of this boy who has been rejected. And God does that over and over and over. You see somebody who's suppressed today in a generation or two, they are gonna be on the top of the heap over and over and over. I'm not saying there isn't suffering along the way, there is, but you know what, here's the thing. If we could all learn that this is the way it works, oppress my child, my child is gonna be running the show in a generation or two, over and over. If we could figure this out, we could save ourselves a lot of trouble, <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be cool if we could just look at every new child and be like, you are gonna be different than any other soul that has ever been on this planet? Awesome. Let's do everything we can to support you in all the ways you need. Let's trust you that when you tell us who you are, we believe you. We don't argue with you. Who better knows who you are than you do? I have a little group of clergy. Some of you have heard me talk about them. They're very dear to me. We got to know each other well in St. Louis when we started doing race work when Michael Brown was killed and all that ensued there. One of those, well, two actually, of the clergy members of the group have trans children, as it turns out, small children, and have become activists, and they're still in Missouri. So Missouri is one of the states that has passed legislation making it illegal for children to receive gender-affirming health care. And as Lynn very well described, we're not talking about, like, we're not talking about uh, surgical <coughs> sex changes for children. We're talking about children who, if they don't feel comfortable in their own bodies, want to leave those bodies. And so anything we can do to keep children alive and planted on this planet and well-oriented, that is a loving gift for God's child. 
And so my friend Rory was in the capital of, Saint, of Missouri arguing with legislators, with her child. And they were saying, what you are doing is child abuse. And she said, I'm a person of the cloth. I'm a clergy person and a mother. Are you telling me that you, legislator, know better for my child than I do? You would think a legislator at that point would respond with a little chagrin. Oh, right, sorry, you're the mom, what am I saying? No, he says, yes, I know better for your child than you do. I need to protect your child from you. By the way, does this sound familiar? Because remember what we did to indigenous children? Right? You remember what we've done over and over children in this country? This is what we do but it doesn't have to be all that we do. If we all decided right now, you know what, enough of this, we're gonna band together and stop these shenanigans, we could make some pretty good ripples, you know? We're doing it already. We have a pride in Madison. You know what it means to those kids who come down and twirl around on the green while the drag queens sing? It seems silly to some of us, but that is a life changer right there. Lynn told you, 40% increase of likelihood to live if one adult in a trans child's life makes known to that trans child that they are loved and trusted and believed. That's all it takes. So look around because everyone in this room knows somebody who's trans. Every one of us, all of us. Some of us are those people and haven't felt comfortable coming all the way out yet. Some of us have kids that haven't felt comfortable coming all the way out yet, but all of us are connected in this community. All we have to do is like, you know, be present, take it in, be real. And the more of us that do it with courage and joy, with peacefulness in our hearts, the more the people who are around us that are afraid of differences will start going, oh, huh. Maybe I don't have to be so afraid. Maybe if these other people are so courageous, I don't have to worry about it. Hagar went with her child out into the wilderness, but when the little water in the skin ran out, she gave up. She left her child under a bush, don't let me see him die. That's human too. But that's not godly. What does God do? God's there watching and going, are you kidding me? Look at this child, we're not leaving him alone in the wilderness, we are scooping him up and building a nation. And what does he know that makes him a nation builder? He knows he's a survivor. He knows that he was different and somebody rejected him that was important, but then somebody else came through for him and believed in him and gave him what he needed to do it, to make it happen on his own. That's what we need in our leaders. People who don't run away from their sufferings, but take their suffering in, know it's part of humanity, stand on that suffering and build something new. Our trans kids, they're leading us. Tony Ferriolo, he's leading us. Our queer kids, our brown and black kids that are like, we are not doing this racism garbage anymore. They are leading us. This nation is changing with every poet laureate, with every trans artist, with every, right, non, whatever normative is, people, all those people who say, mm -mm, I am not accepting what people tell me about myself. I'm not accepting my parents' fear, though I love them, I understand why they're afraid. I am gonna go out there and put my fist in the air and stand with all the colors of the rainbow and bring God's kingdom to life right now. No child left behind, no child left in the desert, no child deserted because they're all our children. They're all God's children. We are all God's children. Don't give up on yourself, on your own differences and particularities. Lean in. Lean into love. Release the fear. God's got us. Even when we feel like we're alone in the desert and our skin of water is running dry, that's the moment to open your eyes and look around because that is about when God is gonna show up and let you see who you really are, how bright you really shine, how little you have ever had to be afraid of. Then you stand up and you look around and you see who else is standing up too and you lift 
them, yourself, one another. That's what we're here for, not to put each other down with fear, but to lift each other up with love and light. Happy Pride. worship service where we offer our tithes, our gifts, our joys and concerns. The plate will be coming your way and the choir will be coming forward to sing to us about this circle that we are forming here together. <coughs>
everybody takes their seats. This is the part of our worship service where we share our joys and concerns, and here comes our deacon to lead the way. She was busy soloing and being greeted, you know, so find my way back up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll start with the joys. <coughs> Prayer for all who are wondering whether, well, wondering whether or how they can be their authentic selves. May we find the courage and peace we need to love ourselves and trust the journey and the God who calls us to it. Amen. Thank you to every person who had a hand in Herky celebration yesterday. Melissa and Roberta, thank you for your lists and pearls of wisdom. Thank you, Tom, thank you for the setup and helping with the china and punch bowl. Pastor Heather, thank you for being the gift you are to us all. Rachel, the flowers were absolutely beautiful. Linda, Holly, Lindia, Karen, Paul, Peter Half, Calvin, and so many others that helped with serving and cleaning up. It is no wonder why we have such a giving, caring, and loving family at NMCC. Much love, Katie. Uh, this one's a joy and a concern. Thankful to God for some healing of a hand injury. Pray for continued healing of this and prayers, please, for healing of knee injury and pain. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I am so grateful for my son's happiness, peace, and all his sharing his life with Dave and myself. From Karen. Please pray for my friend Julianne and I as we hike 96 miles in Scotland in the next two weeks. Traveling mercies and all. This is from Mary Blake Splankson. Wow, that's quite an adventure you got going on. <laughs> Hope it goes great. Um, one concern, please, please pray for my friend Sue who has been diagnosed with cancer for the fourth time. This is from Lynn, and I want to add one more concern. Um, let's all keep Parker in our thoughts and prayers as he goes through a tough time. Amen. Let's unite our hearts and continue in prayer. Holy One, we thank you for this circle, and we pray we pray that you would make it like a magnet, drawing in all those who need a safe place to land. And we pray that you would make it like a well, so we might drop our buckets in deep and drink even more deeply of the living waters there. So we might feel <coughs> replenished and know that we are enough and trust that we will be enough when we are called upon by others with needs, life journeys, questions. We pray that in this circle, when we face inward, we will have grace and understanding for one another, forgiveness, humility when we stumble, listening ears, to receive the feedback that we need when we need it. And we pray that you would bless this circle so that when we stand in it facing outward, we might have hearts of compassion, eyes with your son's vision, arms reaching ever upward and outward, and also down to give a hand up to those who others have shoved aside. We pray that this circle we are in will keep spinning, moving and keeping us moving, even as it stays right here in place where we know we can find it. And we thank you for the gift you have given each of us in calling us to be here today. Whether it's our first time ever or we've been coming our whole lives, you drew us here, God, and this community is sacred because every member that is here today 
is here today. And together we are your son's body. And that means we need one another, just as we are. So thank you. And for all these prayers that we have lifted up, we know you are already caring. For the ones we hold quietly in our hearts, we know you place them there. For those out there in the world who believe that no one is praying for them, we right now send a prayer up and out from this place, reaching out across the planet, wrapping this world and all that lives upon it. From the people, to the critters, to the green things, to the algae, all of it. We send a blessing to every last living cell everywhere. And you promised God that wherever two or more were gathered, in your son's name, your spirit would pray for us. And so we call upon that prayer, we call upon that spirit, we send it out to wrap the globe and come back to us, and we thank you. We love you, God, and we pray together your son's prayer, our fathering, mothering God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing. <clears throat>
Now is the time of announcements. Um, I only am gonna highlight one. You can read through the rest of them in your bulletin. Um, due to us being inside today, I believe grocery cards will now be sold in Fellowship Hall after service. And with that, you are gonna be treated to some more music. <laughs> <laughs>
And may the God who loves us and who made us and very patiently, but very stalwartly, makes this journey with us. Be with us all, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And shalom. Now, as we sing Shalom today, someone, I can't remember who it is, so if it's you, shout out, has been saying for years, can we do Shalom in a circle? So since we've done a circle once today, why not twice, right? So let's Shalom around the room. Is that you? We're doing it. Long time ago. All right, we're doing it. It was you? Quite a while ago.
Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thanks for being with us. Happy Pride. Sabbath blessings. We'll see you next week. Oh, my hair looks terrible. See you next week. <laughs> Bye.